One of the interest, most interesting things about writing this book is figuring out how to write about trips. And it's very hard to do because you're writing about an experience that is so profound to you, but is really going to sound banal to anybody else. I mean, when you have the insight, as I did on more than one psychedelic trip, that love is the most important thing in the universe. I had that insight too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, we're so original. Work to end the drug Hi everyone, my name is Thijs, this is Controlled Substance and today I'm very excited to announce a new guest. Uh, ever since the 1950s, psychedelics have been known to uh, help people with things like anxiety or depression or even addiction. Uh, but then when the counterculture took over the substances like uh, magic mushrooms and LSD in the 1960s, they quickly became controversial, uh, banned, illegal uh, and taboo. So for about 20, 30 years, uh, there was hardly any uh, research into them and nobody was really talking about them except at some dodgy parties somewhere deep at night. But hope is on the horizon for the spiritually needy and scientifically curious alike. Michael Pollan has written a book called uh, How to Change Your Mind. It's out in Dutch now and then it's Verruim Je Geest, which is completely different, um, where he dives into the recent science uh, about psychedelics and how they can actually help people. Uh, he also tries, uh, has tried them himself. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about um, the new medical science about psychedelics, the war on drugs, uh, how to legalize these things, if ever that will happen, um, and uh, things like ego versus spirituality. Yes, might be a little esoteric, but you will learn a lot today. <laughs> um, and yes, I'm also taking him to a smart shop, which is a store where you can actually legally buy some of these substances here in Amsterdam. But before we continue, I would like to ask you to support me on Patreon. Patreon is what makes this show possible. Uh, so please go there and uh, yeah, anything you can miss would be fantastic. Uh, funds will go to things like a new mic for myself. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you'll hear it in the interview. It could always be better. So without further ado, this is Michael Pollan. Enjoy the interview. Michael, yeah. thank you so much for being here. Really You're wonderful. Very welcome. Good to be here. And thank you for writing the book as well. Thanks. It's made quite the impact. Well, I wanted to take you back to uh, uh, four years ago when I wrote this piece for Vice. Um, how, a, how LSD helped me to quit smoking. I quit smoking over the weekend during an uh, LSD trip. And then on Monday morning, I come into the office and they, uh, they basically tell me, well, Three months from now, if you're still if you still quit, because otherwise then it doesn't work. Anyway. Yeah, then you can write about it. So, <laughs> so further incentive. About, what's that? Further incentive. Further incentive, in, it, definitely. And the thing is, when when we when we published this, it really felt like like nailing a pamphlet to the wall and just running running out because I it was such a taboo topic. Also here, like yeah. sort of publicly acknowledging that I even did a psychedelic trip. Um, so that's how it felt four years ago, and there you are suddenly on Stephen Colbert, primetime CBS, yeah. telling sort of America about about psychedelics, and talking about ego dissolution. And talking about ego self. dissolution, I was just like, <laughs> what? How, what? What happened in the past years? What happened? Well, I, you know, I think some science happened. I mean, it's amazing how uh, a good scientific study. Uh, can legitimize a topic that formerly was considered taboo uh, or fringy. And um, I think it really was this um, work being done by Roland Griffith at, uh, at, at Johns Hopkins University, very kind of prominent drug abuse researcher, gets into psychedelics uh, due to a mystical experience of his own in meditation and uh, persuades a very prominent institution that uh, they should study psilocybin and that it has potential therapeutic value. Mm -hmm. One of which was, uh, of course, breaking addictions. They, did, they, they followed up on what you did here and um, did a really interesting pilot study on smoking cessation using psilocybin. So, you know, the other thing that's happening, I think, is the drug war, uh, knock on wood, is kind of losing gas. Um, it's uh, been undermined by a few things. One is uh, the, the, the real, uh, realization in the United States we've filled our, our prisons with uh, people violating the drug uh, laws, um, yet we have a tremendous public health problem around drugs, yeah. around opiates, yeah. um, which by the way was started by legal drugs, not illegal drugs. So that's, that's confounded the logic of the drug war. At the same time, 
Uh, I think really since we had, uh, we began the war on terror in late 2001, the government hasn't needed the drug war quite the same way. Um, if the drug war is not really about ensuring public health, <laughs> which I, I tend to doubt it was ever about, um, otherwise it would not have made such a big fuss over marijuana. Um, it was it's it was a tool. I mean, uh, you know, John Ehrlichman, Nixon's advisor, kind of blew the blew the lid on the the real reason a few years ago when he said uh, the reason we started the drug war was we needed a tool to go after the hippies and the blacks. Yeah. So it was a political thing, the drug war, and it was very useful post Cold War, pre War on Terror. That's really the the, the peak of the drug war. Um, the government needs an enemy. Um, to hold on to power, to, uh, to justify um, depriving people of civil liberties, to, uh, to have a tool where you can, you, know, you can stop anyone in the inner city and, and yeah. good chance you'll at least get them on marijuana. Yet they never talk about it in, in those phrases, right? It's, no. It, 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 I mean, the, the public debate is always about health. These, these sure, it has things to are be. dangerous. It, it can't be about power. <laughs> but it is about power. It then is it about power. You, and, and the government uh, amassed enormous power. Um, uh, and then there is the fact that after so many years, it, it became clear it really wasn't working very well. <laughs> At the same time, you have a growing recognition that some of the drugs that have been demonized, uh, including cannabis and psychedelics, have therapeutic value. The various groups, including George Soros' Open Society, uh, his, their drug program, Peter Lewis is another uh, wealthy businessman who was trying to change the drug laws. They, they came up with a strategy to um, uh, essentially break the back of the drug war. And their strategy was, let's start talking about cannabis as a medicine. Mm -hmm. um, because indeed, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that it helped AIDS patients uh, deal with nausea and, and, and uh, rebuild their appetite. It was good uh, for cancer patients uh, undergoing chemotherapy, and there, these stories were very moving of people who'd benefited from cannabis and were getting busted and things. And they succeeded in, in uh, and they were very open about the strategy, that that was the first step toward what has now happened. So to first sort of normalize the medical use of cannabis, yeah. and then from there on sort of just because get it, a you, general acceptance for it, you, if you want to put that down. Yeah, you, <laughs> you lose the, you know, the whole Cheech and Chong image of marijuana yeah. is like, that's one, the kind of, you know, 70s image of it that was easy to, yeah, it was Still a hip. prevalent here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This yeah. is the last holdout for that that image <laughs> yeah, of marijuana, and um, uh, but suddenly it's medicine, and that that changes the whole conversation, and it's about compassion, um, and I think that and then that paved the way for uh, the decriminalization and and in some states the legalization of. Uh, of cannabis, which is now in my state, in California, we have it, and, and in Massachusetts, we have it, and yeah. in Colorado, uh, Oregon, I believe. Um, yeah, everywhere. And it's still a federal crime, but but the feds right. have, have laid off, even under this administration. But will this now also happen for psychedelics, I guess, is the million dollar question? I don't think it'll be the same. I mean, in some ways, this the, the, the it's on the same course in that it's being discussed as a medicine now. And that will change the image of psychedelics from this the 60s day glow, Timothy Leary image. It, it, it still has in many places. Mm -hmm. So yes, but I don't know. It, it's on a slightly different path. It's on a path toward conventional drug legalization uh, as a medicine. FDA approval in the United States, EMA approval, European Medicines uh, Agency or Administration in, uh, in Europe. Um, whereas... Uh, Cannabis has a lot less science behind it, actually, than psychedelics, oh, really? which is curious. You would think that by now we knew a lot scientifically about cannabis. It's been very hard to study. Uh, the government in America makes it harder to study cannabis than psychedelics, which is kind of bizarre. Um, and the same questions are being asked over and over again when it comes to cannabis, right? Like, how, how riskful is it? Like, how dangerous is it if you keep on asking that same question? Yeah. All the time, you will never get some sort of completely different answer, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But um, psychedelics, um, for some reason, has the government has been friendlier to the scientists who want to work on it. In the case Why? of cannabis, for example, you have to, um, if you want to make, if you want to do any kind of study of cannabis, you have to use the government-supplied pot, and it's this 
shitty pot that they grow in Mississippi, Mississippi right? which is yeah. not the right place to grow <laughs> pot. It's yeah, like, it's horrible. It it's 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 like cannabis nothing. circa 1970, basically, <laughs> and none of the innovations that have happened since are represented. So, so that's a problem. And um, I think the reason that they fell into that habit of denying all those studies is the federal government knew they needed cannabis to have a drug war. In other words, if you excluded cannabis from dangerous drugs, illicit drugs, um, the numbers of people involved in drugs becomes very small. It's like a, a problem involving about two million people, um, which is very hard to justify the, amount, the, the billions and billions spent on it and the changes in the legal system and the, and the, and the you know, dilution of civil liberties, you know, to deal with a public health problem involving two million people, there are lots of public health problems involving two million people. But if you add marijuana, you have tens of millions of people. So you can really paint it as a scourge. The drug problem involves, you know, 50 million people. Um, so I think that was important. I don't yeah. think you could have had a drug war without uh, marijuana being illegal. That's my theory. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of evidence for that, but the numbers certainly suggest that um, it was indispensable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the risks of marijuana have always had to be exaggerated. Yeah. Not that there aren't any, but um, but they've certainly been exaggerated. Well, and the risks of psychedelics as well. Yeah, well, they've been wildly yeah. exaggerated since the 60s. I mean, when I started this project, I believed uh, that the, the, the scare stories I had heard in the 60s were true. You know, that this scrambled your chromosomes and, and kids would stare at the sun till they went blind and people you would fly. fly off of buildings. Exactly. That's, what I, that's all, all I knew about LSD for yeah. 25 years. Yeah. 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 And you think it would make you fly and then you would jump off a building. Yeah. So why, why would you ever do it? That was, yeah, like, that was my attitude. Yeah. I, was, I was terrified of them. Um, I, you know, I grew up on those stories. So, you know, some of those stories turned out to be complete urban legends. Mm -hmm. Some were deliberately made up uh, to discourage people from using LSD. Like and the Sun One, right? The Sun One was exposed as a, 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 a lie uh, out of whole cloth by a well-intentioned lie by the, the commissioner for the blind in the state of Washington or Oregon who had heard about LSD use among kids and was really worried and, and was trying to figure out a good way to discourage them. And he came up with this crazy story and he put it out there. And when it was discovered that he'd made it up, he, he lost his job. But of course, as, as I mean, you know, what happens in journalism is the, the, the first story um, travels the world three times before the correction ever gets made and, the, and no one ever sees the correction. So um, these kind of things float. Now, there are risks. You know, of course, there were acid casualties in the 60s. There were people who ended up in psych wards, and there were, some, there were probably a few suicides. Um, but, you know, it was out of all proportion to the, um, to the real risks. Um, you know, the physiological risks of LSD and psilocybin are remarkably slight. I don't think people realize there's no lethal dose of either drug. Yeah. Which you, is Remarkable. Yeah, considering yeah. you've got drugs in your medicine cabinet that you take for colds and headaches that have a lethal dose. Right. And, um, and they're also non-addictive. And so why is that? Why, where does that come from? Where, where, why as a society have we decided that maybe the psychedelic state in general should be something that should be strictly regulated? Well, they're powerful drugs and they're destabilizing drugs. And, we saw, and they helped destabilize society at one point um, during the 60s. I mean, they did have a, a powerful, when they were embraced by the counterculture, it did have a powerful influence. I think it helped drive the, what we called the generation gap. The fact that you had this very unusual moment in history where the young uh, created their own culture. Um, they had different music, different clothing, different mores, different, um, uh, sexual practices, all sorts of stuff was different. And that doesn't happen very often. And, you, and, and then you had this remarkable phenomenon of young men refusing to fight a war that they were being drafted to fight. I yeah. mean, when, when has that ever happened in history? Usually people like, especially young men who are you know, not risk averse, uh, march off and do what they're told to do and fight wars. And Nixon believed that it was LSD that was doing that. And Timothy Leary had, you know, promised him that was the case when he said, um, young people, uh, people who take LSD won't fight your wars or join your corporations. It was not an empty threat. And that's why Nixon called him the, the most dangerous, the most dangerous man, man in America. America. Yeah. 
He had two most dangerous men in America. Oh, who was the other one? Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who, uh, <laughs> who released the whistleblower, who released the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. But um, of course. <laughs> so uh, it, once it became a kind of talisman of the counterculture. Um, basically, what was happening, I think, is that the young had a new rite of passage, the acid trip. And that rite of passage put them, at the end of it, in a very different mental space than the rest of the culture. Normally, rites of passage are organized by the adults to bring adolescence into adult society. So the adults set the rules, you know, whether, whether it's a bar mitzvah or a vision quest, whatever your culture is. And, a, and, and the kids go through these various hurdles, and when they get to the other side, they join adult community. And so rites of passage knit societies together. Um, not this rite of passage. This one split society because it was a rite of passage um, that belonged entirely to the young. And when you crossed over and had your acid trip and you were experienced, you were in a land that adults didn't, re didn't know about, didn't recognize, and that was very threatening. Yeah. And it's still sort of like that, right? But the moment people think that a certain drug is being used by young people, that's when, they, uh, that's when people start freaking out. Yeah, although in the case of LSD now, you have old people, uh, veterans of the 60s, who, who know the territory. Yeah. And that, I think, is well, another... I'm not sure what your age is, but... <laughs> well, I'm 63. 63. And, and, and although I didn't discover psychedelics till I was in my late 50s. Exactly, yeah. But, um, well, there you go. <laughs> but when I, you know, but I'm talking to regulators, I'm talking to people who are yeah. making decisions now about the future of these drugs, and they don't, they have a more realistic sense of what it's like. They, they perhaps tried them. There are people in the room when the FDA is, is meeting about psychedelic therapy with researchers and deciding whether to approve it who have tripped, who are psychonauts in some cases, closet psychonauts. Um, so that, in a way, is Timothy Leary's larger legacy. I mean, one legacy was the researchers will tell you, oh, he blew it for uh, science because yeah. he, he's, he evangelized so publicly for psychedelics. But the longer term legacy is he, he, he turned on so many people that he helped create a society where the people in charge are not terrified of psychedelics and are willing to take a second look and look at them as a medicine. So, so. It's so interesting because I think still the, the general idea about LSD, I mean, if I mention LSD to people, for some reason it has a, it has still has this dark cloud image, sort of, less so than magic mushrooms. I don't know yes. if it's just the title, um, but he was, he was partly responsible for that, right? To, to, to give LSD that sort of the counterculture, like a weird, weird vibe, like, oh my God, it's too intense. Yeah, and that may be why the researchers are staying away from LSD. Um, you know, yeah. most, of the, most of the drug trials using psychedelics going on today, are, they're using psilocybin, and there are two reasons. I asked them why, because LSD would achieve the same thing. Uh, one is, yeah, it's less controversial, you, and, it's, and it's less well-known. There are tons of people who have never heard the word psilocybin. psilocybin. Yeah, people like last night asking me how to pronounce it. Um, and uh, so that's always helpful. You know, you're not going to have some right-wing congressman standing up saying, you psilocybin know. Psilocybin is killing our youth. Yes, yeah, yeah it, doesn't, it doesn't resonate um, with, the, with, you know, the voter. Um, that's one reason. The other reason is the LSD trip takes so long. And... Um, the researchers and the therapists, they want to get home for dinner. And, you know, if you're administering a 10 or 12 hour trip, you're not going to get home for dinner. So psilocybin kind of fits into the therapeutic day pretty well. It's four to six hours. It's right over there. So I hope they're allowing us to film because that'd be cool. Yeah. But I'm not sure. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, smart, smart shops. shops. Yeah. You, got, you sort of got the hippie vibe going on in some of them, and then the one you saw, Azarius, is much more... Medical. It looked like a... Medical uh, almost, uh, yeah. Drugstore. Just like, real nice. It's, it's run by mostly women, and that helps. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you answer a question for me? Yeah. I haven't gotten a really clear answer on how you get the philosophy mushroom to make a truffle instead of putting up a mushroom. Do you know how they do that? How to, to make a truffle? Yeah. Like, uh, what, do you, what do you do uh, to form, to get the mushroom to form a truffle? Yeah, I, I don't know, but you, you don't. should uh, 
Hey, we go to Procare, ask them for an interview, the yeah. Truffle Brothers. Okay. Uh, if you know them, they're yeah. quite famous. Truffle Brothers. Yeah, Procare. Because uh -huh. uh, they grow them. So, and uh, did they figure out the technique? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah they do it for years. So, uh, yeah. Right. It's, it's a food storage thing, yeah. right? It's a food storage thing. They found out that in the mycelium, it would, it would be so tiny, like really yeah. small. And then they found out a way to just sort of grow them. If, do you have the truffles? They're right, right there. Here? Yeah, it's an empty box. Empty box? Do you have yeah. a full box? Yeah. Because you can see like you have really tiny ones and you got bigger ones. Well, there's this guy. That's oh, that's a that's a huge one. So they're not normally that big. No. I mean, Hi, this is the guy who makes the truffles. Oh, great! Thank you. That's yeah, so That's the big one, and then you see all the other ones. Are sort of smaller ones. Oh, yeah. Of course. Funny, right? I mean, so this is also a way to do it, like legal psilocybin yeah. in my hands right now. I know. It's it's now. And, and what kind of dose is that? Uh, that's a good one. This is um, usually this, so. This is a full dose, but it's I, I wouldn't know how to tra how it would translate to yeah. uh, to, to, to mushrooms. mushrooms because I think usually in the states they would say dried mushrooms, right? And that was very that was for a very long time was not allowed. It was just like a, a legal thing yeah. that you if you dried them that was processing them. So we only. They could only sell fresh mushrooms for a very long time. So this is just the normal dose. Right. The only thing that I that I'm always and that no nobody has ever been able to give a good answer to is if the active ingredient is psilocybin, then why are there five different sort of truffles? If it's psilocybin yes. or psilocin that I'm looking for, then what is the real use of having different that? Maybe there's an answer. Nobody has been able to give it to me. Yet. Yeah. So if you ever find That's out. That's interesting. Yeah, and and they supposedly have different, these different qualities. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. They, they would say sometimes, this one, this one doesn't show it, uh, sometimes they say um, this one's more visual, this yeah. one's more uh, thought-provoking or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Unless uh, it's, I mean, there are 150 different philosophy mushrooms. Yes, but do they all have a different effect? Well, we know azorescence does. Yeah. So maybe. Azorescence has a different effect? Well, that, that, that paralyzing, that no desire to move thing that uh, Stamets oh, yeah, was talking about. Yeah. So so, there may be subtle differences, but but it may be a marketing thing to play them up. Now you've done a lot of these different types of substances. Um, the toad medicine, 5-ACO DMT. 5-MEO DMT, uh, yes. 5-MEO DMT, sorry. Um, LSD, LSD, psilocybin, psilocybin, and ayahuasca. And ayahuasca. Well, which one did you like the most? Uh, I, I had my best experiences on psilocybin, I, you know, I, and I answer you the question that way because I don't, I think the differences are less important than the similarities and that okay. I could have had an equally great experience on LSD, but for various reasons having to do with dose and set and things like that, I didn't. Um, so, uh, and even ayahuasca, I think is more like other psychedelics than not. Yes, it's a more physical experience and the imagery is different and some people get sick, but, um, but the conditions were just so right for um, a couple of my psilocybin trips that um, I have to say those were the most productive and, and interesting. Take me back to the garden. The garden you were yeah. in. These were the, the you, you found mushrooms together with Paul Stamets? Yeah, so when I started, uh, one of the things I want to do in the book is, I'm, I'm, as a writer, my abiding interest is nature, really, and our engagement with the natural world. And I didn't want to lose sight of the fact that these drugs are products of nature. Um, even, you know, LSD comes from a, a fungus, right? Um, uh, and um, so I, I was very curious about where does psilocybin come from? What's it doing in nature? Why do these mushrooms produce it? And Paul Stamets is, of course, the you know, great visionary mycologist of, of, uh, of my generation. And uh, I asked him if he would take me psilocybin hunting. And uh, so I flew up to um, Pacific Northwest. He lives on the Olympic Peninsula. And he said, well, it was a little late for some varieties. He said, but um, there's one variety that I think you should know about. That's um, the most potent psilocybe known, uh, identified by him and found by him and named by him, uh, psilocybe azorescence. It's not in the marketplace, um, 
which I don't totally understand um, because it's actually easier to grow than some other mushrooms. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was hard to find if I read your book. <laughs> hard to find. <laughs> Definitely hard to find. So they've only been found at the mouth of the Columbia River. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. Right, you know, on, either on the Washington or Oregon side. Um, and it's beautiful out there. Ah, it's oh, gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. And yeah. so we went, it was in uh, early December. Uh, it was really cold and windy, and there was no one in, in the, we were staying in this park uh, in a yurt, and, um, and we went out looking for the mushrooms. We were there for two nights, two days, and um, they're hard to find. And I, I, I resolved then I would never ingest a mushroom that I had found on my own without having someone like Paul Stamets. <laughs> and all people Paul Stamets having next to you. <laughs> because they looked a lot like yeah. uh, something called Galler Galleriana, which is uh, uh, the, the field guides tell you leads to an agonizing death. So um, you, you really need to know what you're doing. I don't encourage. I mean, there's certain kinds of psilocybes, like the ones that grow in cow patties in the South or in the Pacific Northwest, like that you're not going to get into trouble with. But as a resonance, you could get into trouble with. So um, we found a few. We didn't find a lot. Um, we found a small handful. And, um, uh, you know, it's funny. He, I was saying, so what are they like? And I was thinking of taking one, you know, that, the night we had found them. And he said, well, they're very strong. You don't, you don't need a lot. Um, and there's a side effect some people don't like. And I said, what's that? P uh, temporary paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I can see why that wouldn't be very popular. And he said, yeah, but that's only a problem if you're outside and it's really cold and you could have hypothermia. <laughs> and it's mid-December and you're in the Yeah, a I know. And, park, and that might park. be why they haven't caught on. Um, uh, so anyway, so I did. Um, you took them home. I took them home and had a, a really interesting experience um, with my wife with them. Um, and was that your first psychedelic experience? You know, I did have some mushrooms in my late 20s mm -hmm. and took a dose that um, I would now characterize as kind of an aesthetic dose, uh, where I was high, but I, I didn't think I was tripping. Um, so okay. this was my first real psychedelic experience where, um, yeah. And uh, I was in my garden, mm -hmm. and it was, um, it, was, it was quite a beautiful experience. It was a hot August day, uh, lots of dragonflies in the air, and, and um, you know, flowers, and the scent of flowers, and very humid. This is in New England. And I had an experience in my garden um, that was quite remarkable, of uh, this sense that um, all the plants were conscious in their own way, and that they had their own subjectivity and that they were returning my gaze in some sense, that they were aware of me. And uh, they're very benign. Uh, they liked me. <laughs> um, and you like them. I definitely like them. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable. And there were these uh, lots of dragonflies going back, uh, uh, this weird amount of dragonfly traffic. And, but it was like planes going overhead, leaving contrails, you know, the traces you often get. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, you know, these ideas that the plants have a kind of agency of their own is an idea I've played with in my writing. I mean, in Botany of Desire, my, my third book, I talk a lot about how much we underestimate plants and that they have, um, they're really heroes of their own story. We see them and they're just sitting there, but in fact, they operate at a different time scale. They're alive. Yeah. Look at they're this not. one. Look at this young, this young leaf. And they're, um, they're, they're aware of their environment. They're responding to it. Um, they don't like being touched, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, plants. <laughs> we learn. Um, so this idea, though, that plants are manipulating us and acting on us at, even as we act on them is an idea that I've written about, but I never felt it in an emotional way. Uh, it was an intellectual conceit. And suddenly it was like full of, it was, an, it was a, you know, a truth. Um, it was remarkable. Um, yeah, because the moment you start talking about this experience, I think you, somewhere you call it the hall, they're like Hallmark cards. Hallmark, like, well, yeah. yeah, there's one of the interest, most interesting things about writing this book is figuring out how to write about trips. And, you know, you've been on Arrowhead, you've read a lot of trip reports. They're really boring usually. And it's very hard to do because yeah. you're writing about an experience that is so profound to you, but is really going to sound banal to anybody else. I mean, when you have the insight, as I did on more than one psychedelic trip, that love is the most important thing in the universe. 
I had that inside too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, we're so original. And it's, you know, but it's, it's totally banal, but it's also true. Yeah. And the line between profundity and banality is very fine. Yeah. And so learning how to write about that in a way that was persuasive, in a way, was the big challenge of the book. Well, there was this really beautiful line in your book um, about that garden. You said, uh, that there's a lot more subjective experience than we give credit for. Yeah. And it's one of those really important lessons that at least I got from psychedelics where you suddenly realize that like that this is not the world, that what's right in front of me, but that there's at least seven billion human experiences and then on top of that the billions and billions of... of it's that. kind of mind-boggling. It is. Uh, but you know, uh, Aldous Huxley said, we, you know, our consciousness is basically an editor and it's blocking, uh, it's blocking out all the information, all the subjectivities, all the emotion, both outside and inside, that we, we would that would overwhelm us unless we narrowed this lens to what we're deciding to think about. Yeah. And one of the things that psychedelics do is they open that lens, and you have access to what can be an overwhelming amount of of uh, emotional and uh, sensory material. And so you you hear music in a way that you can't do anything else because it's so big. It's such a big experience and it's not just music, it's you see it, you smell it, you feel it. Um, so it makes you realize, I think, that consciousness is, is about uh, reducing experience rather than expanding experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's a powerful lesson. Um, and we need to do that. You know, he said that uh, everyday normal consciousness, the ego consciousness, um, uh, reduces inputs to the what he called the measly trickle we need to survive. And you know, if think about kids, I mean kids haven't narrowed down as much as we have. You know, they have I talk in the book about uh, this concept that uh, adults have uh, uh, spotlight consciousness. In other words, we can aim our attention at something, block everything out and do some work, write an article, you know, conduct an interview and 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 think about all the things you're not thinking about when you do this. Children can't do that. That's why they're like you can't teach them anything until they're you know six or seven years old, and and that's because they have lantern consciousness. They're taking in information from all sides, so they're darting around. They're uh, they they haven't loaded their brain with all the kind of models and predictions that we rely on to get through the day. Um, and psychedelic consciousness is, as one of the scientists I interviewed made the point, is, um, is really a, a way to revisit childhood consciousness, where all this information is available to you. It doesn't get processed in a very organized way until the later. The, the baby brain. That the idea. baby brain, yeah. yeah. And um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to recapture that. And it has uses, I think, for mm -hmm. creativity especially. Uh, and emotional availability and things like that. But um, well, yeah, it's not good for getting things done. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But, you know, all of us who are talking about psychedelics, we don't trip when we're doing it. Right? Right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's all reco <laughs> recollected and tranquil. Yeah. And the idea of that, that ego that sort of disappears, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's something that you hear a lot about and it's something that you haven't fully experienced. Uh, if, if I, if no, I, I have exactly. actually. Oh, you have. Okay. I had I had two experiences of what I thought was complete ego dissolution. Mm -hmm. One on psilocybin, one on five meo DMT. Okay. One was terrifying, and one was ecstatic. Um, <laughs> five meo DMT was ecstatic. I, I'm sorry, it was terrifying. It was terrifying, right? Like a rocket being shot out of space. Yeah, it was know, really like, awful yeah. because not only did my ego dissolve, but uh, matter dissolved, time, space. There was nothing except yeah. pure energy, and it was a storm of energy, and it was um, were you sort of like disorienting. A, were you sort of, um, because this is something I experienced once with like a double dose of, of LSD, where just basically this sort of point of consciousness where, where just around you no, nothing is a, is a real object anymore. It, you're just almost like a, like, 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 like a video game. You're, you're this, this point of consciousness, my body didn't exist anymore, my, my, myself, but you're still, you're still something's experiencing it. Yes. Yeah. So there is something. A point. Yeah. yeah. Some, so, so it was just experience. Right. Auditory, visually, whatever it was. Yes. Did, did it but it, but it had no, it had no coordinates in space no. or time. It just that's why I describe it as a storm. It's like being in the middle of a hurricane or a tornado. Um, you can't get oriented at all. There's no narrative. There's no metaphor. There's, there's just none of the, the points we use to orient ourselves in space or time were present, which is, uh, was, that's what was terrifying. 
Um, it didn't last very long. The best thing about 5-AMEO-DMT is it's like over 10 or 20 minutes, um, <laughs> which is not, you know, the highest recommendation. Um, and I would not do it again, partly because I've talked to people about the experience, people who have a lot more experience than I do, and I've heard variously that I did too much or I didn't do enough. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what was the other one? That you well, I was, it was sort of a guided psilocybin trip um, okay. with Mary, who was a guide. That's what I call this guide. And she had created an environment where I felt really safe. And I took a pretty big dose. And um, I, at one point, I looked out and saw myself from this new perspective. Myself had been burst into a little cloud of post-it notes, little pieces of paper, confetti, and that was me, and I was fine with it. This other I arose that was fine with it. And, uh, and then I looked out again, and I was um, reduced to a coat of paint over the landscape of this very thin coat. And, uh, and that, was, that was me, the, 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 the self formerly known as me. And what was really curious about it is that some the ego, the self had died, but something survived it that could take in the scene. And that, and that new perspective, I, you know, wasn't idiosyncratically me. It didn't have character to it. It was just observing calmly, objectively. I mean, Aldous Huxley would have said it was the mind at large, this kind of collective consciousness of the universe. I don't know. I, I don't tend to believe that there is such a thing. But, um, but it was certainly a new, a new perspective that I'd never experienced before. And, you know, the big news for me was that something does survive the death of the self um, and that we're not identical to our ego. And that's a big deal because I think most of us assume we are, that that chattering, you know, self-reflective, self-critical voice is us rather than a character in a somewhat larger drama. Who that we can, constructed ourselves? Yeah, that, that we constructed. And, and it's useful in some ways. I mean, egos are great for getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, but you needn't be its slave, and that you can you know, turn it off uh, yeah. with the help of psychedelics. But having, having ha so one of the, I didn't know how to process that experience mm -hmm. exactly. And I told my guide the next day, during our integration session, I said, so I had this amazing experience of ego dissolution. I realized there's another way to be and, and look at experience. And she said, well, isn't that worth the price of admission? And I said, um, yeah, but it's, it's over. And now my ego's back in charge mm -hmm. and back in uniform patrolling the borders, you know. <laughs> and she said, well, having had a taste of another way to be, less defended, more open, um, uh, less defensive, uh, she said, you can cultivate that. And yeah. I think that was an important lesson. I mean, that things happen during psychedelic experiences. New neural pathways are temporarily created that the more you remember them and think back to them, you strengthen them. Because that's how learning works in the brain. Yeah. And so I asked her, how, how do you cultivate that kind of consciousness? And she said, through meditation. And, okay. that, and that meditation is a way to carry some of the insight of psychedelic experience into your daily life. Like so, mindfulness, maybe. Yeah, mindfulness. Yeah. And so I do meditate with much more success than before psychedelics. I think it's one of the big changes for me. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a great way to kickstart a meditation practice, actually, um, because it acquaints you with the kind of less ego-dominated consciousness that you are trying to get to in meditation. I know we're not supposed to strive, but, but we do. And um, uh, so for me, it, was, it really opened that door. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I just have a little more distance on my ego, and I'm, I'm a little less, I know when it's up to its old tricks. Yeah, exactly. We're and that's very useful. Yeah. And, and of course, I could have gotten there with 10 years of psychotherapy. Right. Or that's or what or you learn. Or journey or travel or something like that. Yeah, but, you know, this happened in an afternoon. It's kind of <laughs> that's remarkable. Very nice. It's a shortcut. I mean, psychedelics are a shortcut. shortcut. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's a shortcut We're against shortcuts because mm -hmm. we believe in hard work. Um, uh, but but it, that's stupid. I mean, I think it's like whatever gets you there. Yeah, right? Yeah. And it's interesting because you said it's, it, it, it's an alternate way to look at it. Um, I think one of the, the, the pitfalls of psychedelics, if you do them too much, is that, that your ego can, can, can disappear so much that you... I mean, it, it's something that I, I think at a certain point, a couple of years ago, struggled with. Like, if the self is just a construct, a construct, and this is this is one of those truths that I now believe, mm -hmm. then what am I on Monday morning? Yeah. And, 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 what, what what's left of me then? Yeah. If I know that I'm just a blip in the universe in space and time. Yeah. 
Now what? Yeah. yeah. Why go to work? Yeah. Why go to work? Right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That that was hard. I, yeah. I I think at a certain point. But you say it's more like a well. Okay. At least you know that now. Well, one is to think of your ego as a tool and okay. um, a tool for helping you, whoever, <laughs> whatever is left of you, <laughs> get shit done. Um, and because uh, they are, egos are very adaptive. There's a reason we uh, we evolved a sense of self. We didn't have to. And probably people who had a sense of self um, had more reproductive success. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So egos are good for getting laid, among other things. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just speculating That's true. now. That's true. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, very often when people are, come out of a psychedelic trip, and Timothy Leary, I think, was one of the biggest examples of it, would maybe th there would be this air around them, this aura of, oh, I, f I found this ultimate ultimate truth and other people have not seen this truth yet. Ego inflation. Ego inflation. Yeah. Suddenly so this is one of the great paradoxes of right. psychedelics. Um, these are ego dissolving solvents and yet nevertheless some people come out of the experience uh, egomaniacs and, and Leary was one. Um, and and I, I think you're pointing to the reason which is that some people come out of it thinking, I have found the key to the universe. I understand the meaning of life. And that's, you know, big news. That and, is big and news. And <laughs> so anyone who starts, who feels they have that, like, has to grab everybody by the collar and drive everybody crazy. And um, so it is an occupational hazard of people who, who take too many psychedelics. And, uh, and it is, I, all I can call it is a paradox, um, because at the, at the bottom of that experience is an experience of ego dissolution very right. often. Yeah, still it's something that you would hope that a lot of people would experience in some sort of way, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, there may, but of course there, then there are tons of people who maybe have had an ego dissolving trip and aren't bothering other people about it. They're just living with their insight and they don't feel the desire to evangelize. Yeah, I don't know. And now I think we both have a materialist worldview, where uh -huh. both atheists, and we just believe in science as a way to, you know, further our understanding of mm -hmm. the world. I, I would assume. Yet a lot of people feel that um, they've maybe peered into a different dimension or, or, or a different spirit world or something like that. How did you how, how did you cope cope with the fact that that was a lot of the literature, the non scientific literature about psychedelics was very often towards that, I think even that, that, that documentary uh, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, somewhere halfway just asserts like, and then I knew it, I definitely looked into a different dimension. And that, the rest of the documentary is then about that. And I was just like, huh? what? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't go there. Um, right? And uh, I think that Many people have experiences that convince them that there is a transpersonal dimension to consciousness. The consciousness is something out there that we tune into. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, there are other dimensions and they're occupied by machine elves and other characters. And I haven't, you know, I haven't taken regular DMT and I'm curious about that experience. Um, and how do you interpret that? That people, many people have, have seen the same things. Uh, and have visited the same places. Um, well, Jung would say these are archetypes, right? And maybe they're hardwired in our brains. Maybe we inherit software as well as hardware. Um, uh, he, he was never really clear where these archetypes resided, but we all seem to share them and they showed up in our dream lives. And our, um, but I have I still tend to assume, and I realize there's not a lot of evidence for it, that, that it is our brain that produces consciousness, um, that there may be laws of nature we, don't, we haven't recognized yet. It's not out of the question, though, that perhaps, as some people have hypothesized, and not just psychonauts, um, you know, people with physics degrees, <laughs> that... Um, uh, that maybe you have to think about consciousness not as an epiphenomenon of human brains, but as a constituent of the universe, like electromagnetism or gravity. Maybe it's, okay. yeah, maybe it's just out there in some form and that complex systems acquire it and it emerges in them. Like you said about plants and animals. I mean, fair, fair, yeah, if I look okay. at a dog very often, Dogs have uh, any, yeah, any animal, basically, I'm always just like they're just they're just like us. They're, yeah. They feel happy. They want to get cuddled. They, yeah. they, they sometimes they make jokes. <laughs> even it's like, 
<laughs> it's true. I mean, yeah. I think it's, but it's when you get down to what about the dragonfly? What about the, you know, the mouse? Um, it gets more complicated. And also consciousness, we have to be careful how we define it too, mm -hmm. because it can mean as little as just awareness of one's environment and the ability to respond in a certain way, in, in which case plants have it. Um, or it can mean what we normally mean by it, which is self-consciousness. Oh, yeah. um, the fact that it feels like something to be me and feels like something to be you. That, and you're very sure of what that quality is, but it's not accessible to anybody else. I mean, Freud said there's nothing we're more sure of, that we are a self. We have a self. It has, there's a quality of being us. And Until they it, take psychedelics. Yeah. <laughs> and, but that's, I doubt that's true of plants. I don't think right. that they have self-consciousness. Um, but you don't know about an octopus or maybe a dog or something like that. That's not like the big question, right? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the more we learn, the more likely it is that at least some higher animals do. Um, so, you know, I think we have to acknowledge we don't know. Um, when, you know, this idea that brains produce consciousness, the Dalai Lama rightly said, that's an interesting hypothesis. But it's only in a hypothesis. I mean, once you look at consciousness studies and, and the science of the brain, any um, honest neuroscientist will tell you, we don't have a clue how you get from meat to, to, to mind. Um, and uh, I think that's true still. I, I tend to think it's the most parsimonious interpretation but others have you know, said, why? why? Why do you think that? I mean, uh, and, and some people do think that you know, there is this field of consciousness and our brains are like TV sets or radio tuners and we, uh, there, it's called a transmission model of consciousness and we tune in. And as, as one, one uh, psychologist doing research on psychedelics said to me, you know, if you, if you wanted to meet the woman delivering the weather report on the TV, you wouldn't look in the TV. <laughs> that's yeah, not exactly. where she is, <laughs> but that could be, you know. But that's, that's a form of speculation, right? Or is it? Yes, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it that is, is like speculation. That, it is, it's but it's but it's a point that we, yeah. you know, a, a naive person, an uneducated person, would when they see a woman on a TV set, yeah. would assume that if if he broke the glass, there she would be. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. But of course, the TV is is only bringing an image of her from somewhere else, yeah. and so could yeah, our brains be like that? It's just a mind, it's just a thought experiment. Carl Sagan always said, maybe. Yes, <laughs> maybe. maybe. I wanted to talk about uh, uh, expectations uh, when you go into a, a psychedelic trip. Yeah, very important. Very important, right? It's, um, I, I found it so amazing when I read your book because when, when I got to that part, um, the first psychedelic ex experiences I had were when I was young. Indeed, like I, was, I think I was 20 or something. Mm -hmm. um, and all I knew about uh, these were uh, mushrooms uh, that you can buy yes. right around the corner legally here, right? Just yeah. a legal product. Um, and all I knew about them was they would give me some sort of visual sensation. Colors would get brighter. That, that's all I knew about them. Mm. And the funny thing is, is that looking back, they, they will forever be the most visual experiences I ever had on them. It wasn't until later how I could use these, these substances for completely different uh, methods that they became something more than just something yeah. like, ooh, sparkly colors, you know? Um, how, can, can you talk about that? How well, I, is that? Well, there's a few things in what you say. One is I think the psychedelic experience changes as you get older. Mm -hmm. I think as uh, young people, the experience is very much about the senses. Uh, they tend to be experiences that are more external than internal. It's about what, what's coming in, expanding, the, opening the valve so more comes in, uh, and that's, you know, if, you know, what's the, what's the conversation among your peers? You know, y all these cool things happen, cool effects. You don't talk to your friends about spiritual experience or, or exploring the psychological depths of your, yourself. That's not the conversation. It's, it's kind of a, I mean, I don't mean to demean it, but it's kind of a thrill seeking, uh, thing. It's, it's, Young people are into novelty, and this is a fantastic novelty. Um, and that um, there are different ways to perceive the same world. And um, but as you get older, you also have more psychological material to work on. Um, you have more history, and and memory becomes a much more important part of it. Uh, so I think, and also your mind is kind of deeper and deeper patterns and habits get established as you get older, and you're kind of stuck in certain grooves. 
um, that psychedelics can help you get out of. Um, you know, we have many more addictions than just to smoking, right? I mean, we're, we're all addicted to media, we're addicted to, you know, bad habits of thought. I mean, also all kinds bad of addictions. Food. Bad food, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I think as you get older, you bring a different person to the, to the party. And, and so different things happen. Plus the fact that your intention changes. Um, and so you had an LSD trip to stop smoking. That's a very different kind of intention. And it is remarkable the extent to which the, what Timothy Leary called the set or intention or the, the mindset you bring to the experience shapes the experience. There's, there's nothing in those pills. You know, it's, it's really all here. It's, it, it, it's a trigger for a, a, a mental process. It's not bringing something. Um, exactly. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's enabling something, uh, occasioning something. So, but the other thing too about these thera more therapeutic trips and the guided trips that I, is really the focus of my book is um, you're uh, accompanied by someone who's not tripping and very experienced. You're wearing eye shades. So you're not having visual yeah, experience. Eye shades, right? yeah. yeah, and they turn out to be this remarkably powerful technology. They change the experience. Yeah, I never use them. So oh, you've got to try it. Na uh, in nature, yeah. I love, well, I love nature. I know, and, and <laughs> people who've had those kind of experiences are kind of uh, uh, have a kind of negative reaction to the idea of eye shades and being indoors and mm -hmm. lying down and everything, but. When you do that, when you, and, and then you have music, right? Either on headphones or they're playing music. And, and that does a couple different things. One is it blocks out any other sensory information, street noise and things like that. So you're, it allows you to lose a sense of being in a place, a specific place. Um, but also the music can, if it's well curated, uh, can drive the experience in certain ways, underscore what's happening, create a kind of arc narrative arc to the experience. Uh, at least that's how the therapists are often using it. Um, but anyway, the eye shades force you inside and it becomes a very internal trip and you explore your memories and you explore your emotions and you're not exploring your environment. And that's a big difference. And uh, I found that incredibly useful. Would I have felt the same way when I was 20? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that's what a 20 year old is looking for. Yeah, right, it's, it, it's, it's almost, uh, well, uh, it's not a waste because it's fun. Yeah. When you're young. I mean, I, I say you can do I, so much more with them when you're yeah. older. Yeah. I say in the book, and it's it's somewhat tongue in cheek that psychedelics are wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they're not. I mean, there are many young people who've had f fantastic experiences on psychedelics, mm -hmm. and it has changed them and, and 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 put them on their path in life. It's done all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. very important. But you know. Uh, it, it, what we haven't, what we know less well as a culture, is the value to people in their fifties and sixties and forties, and that, and, and people, and for people who are dying too, how valuable these experiences can be. Yeah, I met my girlfriend actually of, of ten years already, uh, while on mushrooms, and I always had this idea that I don't know, maybe she was just was she on mushrooms too? No, she was not. Uh -huh. No, I think just on drinks. <laughs> and you're sure you met her? I'm sure she's, okay. she's still, she's okay. still somewhere, yeah, yeah. Uh, she, oh, yeah, she was not a figment of me. I made so it. how did that happen? Um, I, I, I had bought this grow kit for mushrooms because I hadn't used them in years yeah. and suddenly I had way too much of them. So that was suddenly the period in which I started exploring these, these things. I just went into a bar and I saw her and it was love at first sight for me. Um, she always says it wasn't for her. <laughs> <laughs> and um, But I always thought that maybe like the fact that I was on mushrooms, that maybe something was like sort of seared, that she would, that she instantly went through a bunch of like outer layers of me. Ah, uh, that's like, interesting. We've, we've been through a lot, and yeah. sometimes I just still feel like, well, she she became such a part of my core almost. Yeah, so quickly. Because, yeah, because I, um, yeah, so quickly because I had mushrooms. Of course, that was something that just happened while I happened to be on this this, this yeah. really crazy night. Um, it's something I couldn't couldn't have planned. planned. Yeah. But with the smoking, with the smoking thing, that had been an issue. Like the entire weekend, um, I had been trying to quit for a while. My friend uh, forced me to buy a pack of cigarettes for that weekend when we were going out to like a house in in, in nature uh, to trip. And um, it wasn't until we got home, I think, like even like somewhere in the in the later stage, more like the reflective stage of the of the psychedelic experience that um 
that I started contemplating it. So it, it was something that oh, was so really you didn't you didn't say I want to quit smoking. I'm going to take LSD to do it. That's not how it happened. No, definitely Interesting. not. No, I didn't even know of the the whole principle. Yeah. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. It was just it was me looking at a pack, and just hallmark truths. <laughs> yeah. How stupid is how this? Stu uh, nicotine is an incredibly boring drug. Like imagine. This acid that I that yeah. I had now, this is no contest. Yeah, no contest. <laughs> okay, and why do I go out for a smoke? It's simply because my friend my friends are going outside, right? Um, and it's something to do. Yeah. Yet on the other hand, it's so incredibly unhealthy for you. Cost benefit analysis. On the, that's when it just sort of snapped, and that's when I I walked out. I was like, I think I just quit smoking. And yeah, so my friend was like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Same for the for the editor's advice. They were like, eh, uh, well, yeah, wait uh, three months. Yeah, wait three months. So it, it, it. So why do you think LSD allowed? I mean, it gave you the insight, okay, but why did it make it so sticky that you could? Because it reprogrammed certain thought patterns. Like it's like you said, we we, we have these habits of maybe media media intake or mm -hmm. or, or bad food or whatever, and. You just make these decisions really sequentially. I'm doing this, this un unconsciously, of course, but th that's just how you, that's just how mm -hmm. you work. And then when you suddenly see all these decisions, you can, I mean, that's that's how it felt to me. Like I sort of flipped a couple of switches so that suddenly my thoughts yeah. would travel a different, yeah, a path, different path, and that would be it. It, it wasn't like well, the uh, the, the other, the, the idea of then still wanting to smoke was just it, it, it magically disappeared. That other yeah. Brain path, sort of. Yeah, and that's I think what it helped me feel like that's right so now. I could, right? Yeah. So another element that may explain it, because um, mm -hmm. I've talked to the researchers doing the smoking cessation study at at uh, Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. um, is that there is a quality to the psychedelic experience that uh, William James called the noetic quality, um, and that is that the insights you have, the epiphanies that occur, have a, don't feel. Uh, merely subjective, a mere opinion, one, one man's thoughts. They have uh, a weight, an authority that comes out of the experience itself, that these are revealed truths. And so those banalities, um, smoking's bad for you, I mean that's very common among the people in these trials. It, they believe it in a way they've never believed it before. It's, it's like on a tablet handed down from God, you know, <laughs> rather than just like, yeah, 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 I've heard that. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, that's uh, yeah. and that, you know, on one day we can say smoking's really bad for us, and the next day we can say, oh, fuck it, I'm going to have one more cigarette. Yeah. And you, you can't do both those things after that experience. Yeah. It's fascinating. How, how does this work? I mean, it's incredibly hard because we don't really know, but what can you say about like, where does this noetic quality come from or how does it work neurologically? What, what do we know? Well, I, we don't know. I mean, we can hypothesize. I mean, I, one of the ways I understand this noetic quality is that it, to, to, to just basically have opinions and insights and ideas circulating as, oh, that's what he thinks, that's what she thinks, there's a, you need a, a, a dis clear distinction between subject and object, and that this is just subjective. This is just what I think for you know, reasons I, you know, psychological, whatever. Once you dissolve the subject-object duality, which happens in a high-dose experience, everything's objective. Um, so this isn't just my opinion, this is true. And um, so I think it may have something to do with that. I mean, that's, that's a, you know, speculation, but that's one way to understand it. And that when you dissolve that distinction, um, whatever you learn, whatever you believe at that moment has a higher status than it did when it's just, this is me, this is my subjective opinions. My dad, sometimes I would try to relay these things to my parents, but they, they're super anti-drugs, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very often I would I would watch uh, Carl Sagan at the end of the trip, which is <laughs> amazing. I can I, I can really recommend anybody to watch Cosmos, yeah. like at the end of the psychedelic trip, because you get these really like intense scientific truths. Uh, yeah. too. And my dad was like, "Yeah, so we're all made of stardust." So, <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of was like, "Sure, okay, yeah. Right. I mean, I can linger on it, right. you know, but I still need to go to work, yeah. you know, yeah." So. I get it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was it was good to find a balance in it. So at at the end of like sort of this whole period in my life, I guess in which they played a larger role, 
Um, I also came out of it in, in a sort of way like, great that I got that perspective, now let's go back to work, sort yeah. of. But how do you look at it? Has, has this changed you? Has this changed your life in a way, or do you still just take it as a, an experience, like going to college? Or no, it's had uh, it, it has had lasting effects. I, I I wouldn't say I was that way. Now I'm this way. You know that I'm the, I'm a different person, and I can that this was some you know like I was born again. You know conversion experience. I, I wouldn't say that. I mean I'm back to baseline in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. There's a period of about a month after a big experience where you do feel different. Um, and you go through, you feel like you're going through the world in a slightly, with a slightly different set of clothing on or different eyeglasses or whatever. Um, but over time, you're, you're kind of back to baseline. The things that have stayed with me are, um, uh, I think, and, and you know, I've been asked this question so many times, and I, I had to consult my wife, of course, because who, who knows better if you're the same or different, right? Someone, yeah. and we've been together for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and she, she put it an interesting way. She said, I, you know, I think you're kind of more, you're more emotional than you were, more open to emotion. Um, uh, and the example she used was, um, my dad died in January, and it was a very painful last couple of weeks, and um, I was more open to that experience and more present for it than I think I would have been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was with him the last 10 days. I, I, was, I moved into their apartment, and... Um, you know, I'm a busy person. I could have found excuses not to be there so much, uh, but I you was opened up to that experience. Yeah, I yeah. was. I was very present to it. I, 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 I was able to say what I thought to him and and um, and to my mom, and uh, and I think I would have had more trouble with that. Now I'd spent all this time interviewing people who are dying of cancer because of the yeah. the book, um, but she thought that was that represented a, a slightly different me. Uh, slightly different. Yeah. It's but not like you became a completely no, different person. No. no. And that kind of, uh, and I do, I do, various things come up and I realize I am more open to emotions than I was. I feel them more strongly than I used mm -hmm. to. And th I think that's really interesting. That's beautiful. I think I'm more, I had a moment last week, I was finished, I had my last class, I teach writing, and I teach a, 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 se a small seminar, uh, and I had 12 students who I'd gotten to know pretty well. Uh, it was an art of the personal essay class, so... There was a lot of sharing going on, and um, uh, and I was summing up the class to them and getting ready to say goodbye and talking about their careers, and, and I teared up, and I was like, oh my God. That had never happened? Never happened. Really? And they were like, what's going on here? This doesn't happen at Harvard. <laughs> you became a nicer person. Uh, I don't know if it was nicer, but definitely more emotional. So, so those kind of changes, I think, are real. Um, I think that yeah, it I, would be so nice if, if a teacher just saying farewell or saying goodbye. Yeah, it was a very nice. honest moment. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else? And, and then I do think I have a little more distance on my ego. And I can sort of see when he's up to, you know, no good and can quiet that voice when I need to. Yeah. Um, and I think that's useful. That kind of perspective is very useful. So, um, and you know, I feel more kinship with the plants in my garden. <laughs> it's also really nice. Yeah, so you know, it's nothing, it's nothing mind-blowing, um, but valuable even so. Yeah. And I wasn't setting out to solve a problem, um, like breaking an addiction mm -hmm. or getting in touch with some childhood trauma. I mean, there, there are people who have really clear therapeutic objectives. And it does change their life completely. Or, or fear of death, say. People who yeah. are really confronting their mortality. And they have an experience that that completely lifts their terror. That's that's amazing. They are they are different people before than they were, uh, you know, before and after. So uh, again, I was doing it to satisfy my curiosity and learn about my mind. Curiosity satisfied. Yeah. yeah. And um, so a lot, so much has to do with your intention. Yeah. And it's so it's so useful to have one. You don't have to have one, but it's really useful to have one and see what happens. Yeah. I think we got about more, 10 more minutes? Uh, yeah, 10, 15. Okay, okay. I just want to talk about the future of where this is, where this is all going. Um, it, well, you've done a couple of these uh, psychedelic trips un unsupervised, so mm -hmm. maybe only your wife was, your wife mm -hmm. was there. Uh, it, it seems that, that it's very much moving towards a world in which if it's legalized or if it's, if it's allowed for therapeutic uses, it will always be with some sort of guide. Do you see... I mean, here in, in the market here, you can, as a tourist, you can just buy 
uh, psychedelic truffles and right. go out into a park. Right. I, is that something you will see happening in the U.S.? Or what do you think? I don't think so. I, you know, I think in the U.S. there there are a couple ballot initiatives to legalize uh, mushrooms. In California, California and Oregon. I don't, I don't think they're going to go that far. Partly because the voters don't know what it is, and partly because it's too soon. People don't know enough. I I, I think. You know, politics is all about timing, and there, you haven't built enough public support for this. So what happens is if you bring something to, into the political debate too early, you lock people into positions, politicians especially, and they're, and they're going to say no, and then they're going to have trouble changing their positions. So I, I would not push it there yet. Uh, I don't think that's smart. Mm -hmm. um, the path in America, and, and this is true in Europe too, um, not so much in, in Holland, but elsewhere, is this very conventional drug trial leading to approval as a medicine, FDA or EMA process, and country by country process in Europe. Um, and that is going very smoothly, um, and I wouldn't mess with that, because um, I think that'll be a big deal when that happens. It will, it's true, it will medicalize um, psychedelics. And I think it would be a shame if that's all that happened. I think there's several other, or at least a couple of other contexts in which they could be useful. I mean, one is medicine. I think we're going to find that it's very useful for treating a range of illnesses, including depression, addiction, anxiety, obsession, eating disorders, and the, the, that whole complex of um, conditions that are characterized by kind of rigidity of thinking, of ego-dominated thinking, of um, uh, people getting trapped in destructive habits of thinking, that the, all those things are more alike than not. Um, and that we have a new tool, it appears, that can help us treat that, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, psychedelics have been used for a very long time and are still used in a religious context. You have the Native American church with peyote, you have the ayahuasca churches from Brazil, which now are rooted in the United States. Um, you have, uh, you know, the Mazatec, the Indian use of, of psilocybin in Central America. And that's an equally legitimate context. Um, it's also guided, it's, it's worth pointing out. People don't do these drugs alone. There's usually an elder involved. There's, uh, they're done on special occasions with a real clear intention. So the challenge is now, if you're not part of that religious context and you're not, you don't have a diagnosis that puts you in that medical context, what about the rest of us, right? People for whom we may not be depressed, but we have sadness. We may not be clinically anxious, but we're anxious. Mm -hmm. um, we may not be addicts, but we're addicted to, to other things. Um, the drugs clearly have value for us too. So how do you create a, a safe context in which they can be used? I don't think it's merely legalizing them. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the drugs are very powerful. They, are, they can be destabilizing for people who aren't mentally sturdy. And I think the idea of a guide is very important. So, but I also you know, acknowledge that uh, you shouldn't go to jail for eating a mushroom. Um, I mean, that just yeah. strikes me as absurd. So I'm not exactly sure what to do there. Um, yeah. I don't know that outright legalization is the right thing. I think it should be uh, regulated in some way. I mean, maybe, you know, like driving a car, you have to take a course before you can have access to this. Yeah, or, um, like that. or that um, you're a member of a club, maybe, or yeah. somebody only you who's a member of a club can provide them. Or so, so imagine, uh, like let's imagine mental health clubs where you could go uh, instead of, you know, physical health clubs. Yeah, instead of the gym. <laughs> and that these health clubs have clinicians, right? who screen you and make sure you're not at risk. Um, and, uh, and then they administer them in this safe, beautiful place out in nature. I mean, I can imagine those yeah. institutions e existing. Yeah. They would be regulated in some ways by the state, that there be trained people there, mm -hmm. um, that they take a medical questionnaire before they give it to you. Yeah. So I, I, I just don't think it's like you're going to do this in coffee shops or no. the equivalent. Um, I think we have, to, we have to bring a little more care to it. I think that these drugs can be used carelessly. The advantage of legalization is you can regulate, of course. If, if you prohibit, there's, anything goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, don't, I, I don't pretend to have the answer on that, but I think it's a really important cultural project right now to design that third, third context. context. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ever going to use psychedelics again after this? 
I would like to. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been uh, avoiding it since the book came out, just because I'm so public about my own use, and yeah, I want right. and I want to protect my guides uh, from any kind of attention. Um, who knows who's reading my email? And right. um, so I haven't been referring anybody. I haven't been doing anything myself. Um, I can imagine, you know, if this became accepted in the way I'm describing, that this would be something I would do every year on my birthday. I think, it's a, <laughs> yeah, I think it would be a great way to kind of celebrate a birthday, take stock of your life, where, where you've been that year, where you want to go, set some intentions. When's your birthday? February 6th. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, Christmas and New Year's. Between Christmas and yeah. New Year's, that's, that's, oh, that's I, really The other thought one. was New Year's Day, but who knows oh. if the guys want to work on New Year's Day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Michael, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. That was great fun. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, good luck on your next book. What's the next book going to be? No idea. I have to take a trip and find out. <laughs> uh, space travel. Immersive journalism. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the overview effect. I usually, the yeah, the, oh, that's a fascinating <laughs> topic. Um, I usually write a couple of articles in between books till I find something that's, oh, yes, something this needs a book. Yeah. Um, and this was one of those stories. Uh, sometimes you write an article and you realize, that's all, I've done it. That's all I want to know about it. <laughs> Other times you realize, Oh, I just scratched the surface. Yeah, yeah. yeah I want to dive in. Yeah. 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 Nice. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the inspiration also. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, real perfect. Can I take this article? Yes, please. Please do. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I, I, I was sort of happy that you didn't dive into Rick Dublin's story so much. Oh, because, yeah, you know, I did. I'm working on a book, actually, and I want to completely do his, his Good. story. Good. It's a it's great stuff, story. It's amazing. He's a wonderful character. Yeah. Senses amplified with every shrew I feel like I'm back in my mother's womb I almost threw up from what I was chewing on But now I understand where I'm coming from Buzzy! Buzzy, are you there? Buzzy! Now I'm seeing the world through a completely new lens The walls, they are melting, but life's making sense I'm amazed how the most psychedelic kind of goods Are magically growing outside in the woods <laughs>